Our laws as it pertains to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell do you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it, I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. So here we are back with you guys. We are also on the restream. We see you all out there. Uh, also in Clubhouse, uh, as always, we'll be taking calls off the Clubhouse. A big week coming up. We have uh, Jay Bhattacharya in here tomorrow. We have uh, Vinay Prasad coming in uh, Tuesday of next week. And today we are very fortunate to have Dr. Lucy McBride. You can see her website at Lucy McBride, L-U-C-Y McBride.com. Also Facebook, uh, Dr. Lucy McBride. Instagram, Dr. Lucy McBride. And Twitter. Dr. Lucy McBride, all of this, the same. Dr. McBride is a, a Harvard-trained physician, uh, Johns Hopkins uh, residency in internal medicine. She is a frequent uh, media contributor, particularly to The Atlantic, and she is trying to help people make sense of the news. Sound familiar? She and I, as she said to me in our warm-up here, are two peas in a pod. She's also particularly interested in the confluence of illness, physical health, and mental health, much like you hear me talk about that as well. And her website and her uh, her newsletter, which has become a source of important information for 16,000 people, help people make sense in real time with fact-based information uh, in the middle of this pandemic. So please welcome Dr. Lucy McBride. Drew, thanks Everyone. for having me. Thank I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. How do people me? get I'm, to be on the letter? Get to on the end to get your newsletter. How do we do that? It's real easy. You go on my website and you can sign up, and you'll get a, a, a little uh, delivery in your inbox every Monday. Um, I'm trying to keep track of what's happening in real time and help people cut through all the noise. You know, there's so much information. People are overwhelmed. People are exhausted, and I'm trying to insert a little bit of my sort of silly humor and a little bit of my personality, if you will, um, and, and talk about how to manage these stressful times in addition to managing the virus and the risks of it itself. Yeah, uh, I, I, from the beginning, have been deeply concerned about the panic that the press was inducing. And now I have spoken to decision makers uh, and people that were uh, advising decision makers. You know, what what was that? Why did you close school downs, schools down? Why did you prevent people from lying towels down on the beach? What what was that? And now they're starting to say out loud, "Oh, that was panic. That was panic. We had to do something." And I thought, "Wow." Can you imagine if you or I were making decisions at the bedside in an intensive care setting and started to panic and that was driving our dis medical decision making? It's it's just it's sort of disgusting to me. I, what do you think? Well, I think that, you know, hindsight, you know, certainly is 2020 and I think we really didn't know a lot about this virus back in early 2020, but certainly now with 20 plus months of accumulated knowledge and real world data on the extraordinary effectiveness of these vaccines and with a clear sense of how to control the virus. I mean, there's, there's certainly a lot we don't know, right? Um, but you know, we know right. that the vaccines work extraordinarily well. We know that surface transmission is just not really a thing. We know that outdoors is safe. No. We know that kids and, yeah. and are suffering from the emotional costs of ongoing pandemic restrictions. I mean, we should be tailoring yes. our public health response and, and, a little more elegantly. Uh, uh, elegant is a kind word <laughs> to use, L at least taking into account risk reward analysis. And, you know, both of us have an interest in mental health, and that seems to have been completely disregarded. Child development, child mental health, what it means to push people into poverty, substance use. I, I mean, they just completely ignored that and still seem to be blind to it. Well, that is my biggest frustration and sorrow right now is that 
you know, as you, I think, agree, Drew, you know, health is about more than simply not getting a, a single respiratory virus, right? Health is about our everyday right. lived experiences, is about our relationships, you know, with work, our relationships to ourselves. It's about, it's about having a job and being able to feed our families. It's about, you know, having trusted sources of information. And so much of our sense of normalcy has been thrown out the window so it's not surprising that we're seeing, you know, overdose and opioid, you know, in, rates increase. We're seeing diseases of despair um, in parallel with the virus. And, you know, I really worry, as I think you probably do, that, you know, we're going to see the ripple effects of, the, of the, you know, the mental health toll for, for decades. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, we, we, mm-hmm. know from, we know from traumas like 9-11, and that was, you know, a, a different trauma, of course, but that the physical, emotional, behavioral, medical manifestations can last for, for decades. And then you know about the, the data on adverse childhood events in children, right? ACEs. And, you know, I would argue that most kids, even if they look like they're fine, masked up in a school and not communicating like they would normally would with their teachers seem fine, that they're yeah. experiencing something that's not normally that will have lasting effects. Hopefully not, but... I, I don't see how it couldn't, especially under the age of five. And and by the way, let's be clear, the World Health Organization is explicit against masking under the age of six because of this issue, not just the fact that you are creating oppositional defiance against the parents when these two-year-olds don't want to wear a mask. The fact is that particular developmental stage is when the face and not language is the way feeling states are communicated, the way emotional landscapes are built, the way regulatory systems in the brain are, are set up. The words do something, but it's mostly facial expression of the caretakers that transmit to the in the essentially the midbrain regions of the of the emotional systems the capacity to name emotions, experience emotions, feeling felt and regulate those emotions. And we're, I, I, was, I was lecturing a group of teachers and they were talking about the distress they were seeing in kids. And they said, they asked me, what, what should we do? And I said, well, you know, get down to the kid's level, focus on their face, show, express with your face an appreciation of what they're feeling. And they just went to me, they go, yeah, but the mask. And I thought, oh, yeah. it's impossible. It's just impossible. Yeah, you I can't mean, do it. I, I mean, the argument that the kids don't mind and that kids are resilient, you know, is is frustrating to me because, sure, there are kids who are pandemic proof. But let's face it, as you just said, Drew, we need to see other people's faces to develop socially and emotionally at, the, at those ages. Um, and certainly for reading and for learning, it's important to see other people's expressions and the full range of their you know, emotions on their face. And it's not that the World Health Organization is kooky or nuts by recommending against masks in under five. It's because they've thought about the harms of masking weighed against the benefits. So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you and I think about this all the time in patient care. You know, when I recommend anything in medicine, I've, I, I think through the, the risks and I think through the benefits and I communicate that with my patients and we make a shared decision on what is right at that person's, you know, at the, at the time. Um, we need to really think hard about what harms, unintended consequences there are of these ongoing pandemic restrictions while mitigating the death and destruction from coronavirus itself, because we can do both. We can walk and chew gum together. We just need clear instructions, clear communication, um, and to recognize ultimately that health is about our, you know, a mental health as well, that mental health is health as well right right i i the fact it, i i the one thing that early on jumped out at me was that our public health officials seem unable to make a risk reward analysis they just don't seem to be trained to do that which i found astonishing um but it doesn't seem like they are understand or have no judgment at least around risk reward analysis when you know in our world that's all we're doing all the time every move we it's make always- we do bad things to patients yeah Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it, it is it is sort of shocking. I mean, we're seeing you know the the ripple effect, the 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 post traumatic stress on our collective beings right now, and it's going to be mm-hmm. ongoing. And so, you know, I don't know what more it's going to take for, for example, you know, outdoor masking, for example, um, to be lifted in in schools, for example. 
or for us to recognize yeah. that, um, you know, it, it, I, I get I get in a lot of trouble when I talk about children because um, because I have a strong opinion about certain policies we have in place. Um, but I think one of the reasons I'm so interested in thinking about kids and the collateral damage of pandemic restrictions on them is because as an adult physician, and I, I see it adolescents and adults, so many of so many of my patients' problems, like their their challenges and their health and their behaviors, are rooted in childhood issues like neglect, of course. abuse, certainly, but neglect, anxiety, fear, sort of unmet mm -hmm. needs in childhood that then led to, mm -hmm. say, a wobbly relationship with food, a, a difficult relationship with alcohol. Um, you know, mm -hmm. difficulty regulating emotions, regulating sleep, and those things manifest in their health from blood pressure to blood sugar mm -hmm. to their weight. So when you, when you every day see patients, as you and I do, whose childhood had something to do with the medical problems they have as adults, it's really hard to sit back and not say something about these ongoing restrictions that aren't always rooted in, in science. That's, well aren't always, you're being kind again, aren't always rooted in science. We, we, we're, well, we're taking issue with this stuff that explicitly is not defensible and has adverse effect. Well, let's, let's also acknowledge that there are some things that are scientifically true. Like, for example, we know that masks, you know, they have some utility, right? But it's not about whether masks okay, so, work or not. Although that, that's part of it. It's about what are the harms against the benefits. It's about a. It's about a judgment. Well, let, let's, about critical yeah, that's right. It's about it's a risk reward analysis exactly. So so let's talk about masks. So the benefit of masks out of doors is zero because there's zero transmission outdoors. Essentially zero, approaching zero. So yeah, no, I mean, no dispute about that. That's signaling, that's virtue, that's nothing, that does not follow science. Anybody says they're following science and wears a mask outdoors is not following science. Do we, do we agree on that? So, yeah, I mean, if you want to wear a mask outside, that's perfectly fine, but less than 1% of, and, you know, less than 1% is a, is a pretty wide range, right? Like that includes zero of cases um, are, are derived from outdoor transmission. So certainly, if you are someone who is floridly ill with COVID and you coughed in someone's open mouth outside at a park, yeah, you could transmit it. But let's yes, face it, that'd be a problem. Not, that'd be a problem. <laughs> it is, but let's talk about like no outdoor transmission is just not a thing. I wrote about it in the Atlantic right. back in right. the spring, and I got like right. you know lots of good good responses. But people were furious that I was just you know a proponent of child genocide for recommending kids not mask outside. Um, right, which is, right. you know, so that's, that's insanity. Just, let's call that what that is. Yeah. That's insanity because that's yep. insanity. So let's talk about masks. So let's talk about masks more generally. So masks yeah. are not 0%. We both agree that masks have some effect. It's not zero. It's definitely yeah. not zero. Right. Yeah. A and the only, the only controlled studies we have were out of Bangladesh and Denmark and they give Correct. us. 12 to 20 percent or something so let, let's just let's give it the benefit of that and say 20 percent. let's say a 20 percent benefit that's not zero that, that's real that's 20 percent. I, I mean it's not vaccine level level um protection but it's it's something so do we do we agree on that is 20 percent a reasonable number yeah. at least I mean, based on what we know yeah if you look at the best study done in, uh, from researchers at yale and stanford done in bangladesh they showed that in people over 50 so adults that surgical masks, not cloth masks, surgical masks offered an 11% reduction in transmission. So that's not nothing. But remember, that was pre-vaccine. Um, and that was in an area where there is low seroprevalence, meaning like people hadn't been exposed. So we're really stress testing those masks. Um, in other words, it's not nothing, but it's also, I think we need to agree, although it's hard to get anyone to agree with anything, anyone says these days that, that the, 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 the benefit of masking goes down as you've been vaccinated, because when you're vaccinated, you are less likely to be carrying virus in your nose. You can also neutralize the virus when you've been exposed. So the mask is no longer doing that 11%, um, you know, after you've been vaccinated. So again, I've never said masks don't work. Um, they, they do. It's just, what are the, what are the, how much do they work? And what are the harms right. of, right. we can't mask forever, right? Like people, we can't, I mean, if you want right. to, you can, but we shouldn't people, mask kids forever. And plus people behave as though what, not wearing a mask is transmission. It is not, it is not at all. It's it, not wearing a mask 
you're lo you're losing that 20% potential benefit or so. So so that those are the good studies. There are other studies there was a recent study that showed 53% or something it was a sort of a meta analysis, a bunch of composited data. I don't know what to make composited, of that. Composited, composited, uh, what, right? What did you do? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it yeah. looked at very six different, different than a controlled study. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it, it looked at six different studies and I've had a lot of people smarter than me kind of help me dissect it and look through it. Um uh and and you know, a number of the studies were, were had various biases. And, and again, like 50% seems high, but what, what I'm having a hard time with is like I saw on Facebook today, there was a teacher using the 53% the metric to say how frustrating it is that he has to, you know, police the young kids in his classroom wearing masks because of the 50%, 53% chance of them transmitting the virus to him. And, you know, he's vaccinated. So that's just the unfortunate thing is that the media has taken and, and some doctors have taken that 50 percent, 53 percent number as gospel when you really need to look beyond the headline and look at the data and the studies themselves um, with yeah. people who are trained to look at medical studies. And, you know, I rely on my epi um, public health colleagues a lot. Like, I don't claim to know everything. Just ask my children. Um, but, you know, when I went <laughs> through that the, 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 that meta-analysis, it was clear that it's hard to, you can't just say 53%. You have to look at the actual analysis. Right. It, 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 let's see, let, let's give it 30%. Let's just, just for the, yeah, again, this is rounding. Let's, let's say, let's say, yeah, we'll give it 30%. How does the head of the CDC announce that it's 80%? How did that even happen? What What is she talking no, about? That was the no most astonishing knows. statement. What, one of the most astonishing statements of the pandemic. It was astonishing, you know, because it may sound strange, but I, I'm really rooting for Rochelle Walensky. I mean, I, I would like her to be able to, I, I, we, I, we need for public health institutions to, you know, be beacons of strength, honesty, and yep. flexibility yep. during a global pandemic. But when you say something like masks yep. are 80% effective, and, and no one knows where that metric came from. It, it's really, really difficult to uh, to walk that back or to 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 have people trust, you know, the CDC. Although, look, I think they're doing. A, 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 the, I mean, it's complicated, but I think I think they're they're do, you know, as someone said, I can't remember who, you know, the CDC was a clunky organization in peacetime. So in wartime, it's going to be it's going to be even more difficult. But they could be definitely be messaging more clearly and more correctly. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly with your wish for them. I, I, at the very beginning, kept saying, just listen to the CDC, listen to Dr. Fauci. I don't know about you, but I've been through five pandemics with Fauci. Fauci is the reason I got involved in radio in 1984. He was my guiding light during HIV. He was during H1N1, SARS-1, MER, you know, MERS. He, he was... I mean, just exceptional. And I'm hoping he reverts to his mean in this particular pandemic, though. He, he too seems to have been affected by the politics somehow. I, I, and I don't know, I don't know what to do with that. Uh, and, yeah, I and mean, then to he, hear Walensky he, say 80%. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, he, he like, like, like a lot of people in public health should know, and I, I know, I know he does because he's a really a smart person. You know, have, to 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 know that the lessons we've learned from the HIV epidemic, for example, really need to apply here. That you know, the, the notion that abstinence only is not a good public health strategy, and that harm reduction is harm reduction, meaning a strategy where we meet people where they are. We understand that people naturally take risks because they're human beings, not robots, and we arm them with tools and information to manage the complex, messy, and risky world we live in. You know, when I talk to patients, for example, like I saw a patient this morning who's obese, like I have a number of obese patients, obesity is an epidemic in this country. Um, if I said to my patient, you know, right before Thanksgiving in particular, never drink alcohol, never have a piece of sugar, never have pumpkin pie, exercise an hour a day, and didn't talk to her about the fact that she's under enormous stress, is, you know, overeating because she's not sleeping enough, and she's trying to stay awake at work and parenting kids on you know, who are dealing with emotional challenges and didn't help her manage sort of the everyday contours of her, her life, or just talk about stress. You know, in other words, if I was sort of preaching from a pulpit of, you know, abstinence only, 
that one, first of all, she'd never come back probably to see me again. And second of all, it's just not right. an effective way right. of counseling people. Um, and, right. you know, instead, and, and we, I'm we've gone one step further. We've gone one step further. We've said uh, because of your transgressive behaviors, you can't go to the hospital if you get sick. I mean, think about those to my patients that do drugs. We we said we uh, you go to an ER if you want to see the you know who's who's in the ER. It's my patients. It's people making bad choices. If not taking a vaccine, bad choice. But there are lots of bad choices that people make, and we give them health care. It's really that That's was right. another astonishing moment in, in this pandemic. But I'll let you comment. Astonishing, and yeah, it's all the moralization of of human behavior. I mean, you know, I, I want to say to some of these people who are moralizing human behavior, like, who made you the arbiter of? sort of purity, right? I mean, I'm flawed, you're flawed. Maybe you're not flawed, but I, maybe you just, you know, not live, flawed, living. flawed, flawed, flawed. <laughs> Where are my flaws but, but brought like, <laughs> proudly? I, totally. I mean, I do the best I can. I am not not perfect, don't claim to be. Um, so I think that we need to be honest with ourselves as people who are, you know, talking publicly to other human beings that, that, that we're all, you know, we're not all trying to do the best we can. Some people don't have good intentions, but I think we yeah. shouldn't be shaming and blaming people. It's not a good strategy for making for for helping people enact a behavioral change. I mean, behavioral change is the hardest part of my job, right? Helping people quit smoking, leave an abusive yeah. marriage, cut yeah. back on alcohol, limit yeah. their sugar intake. But yeah. most people I see, they want to make those changes. They they want to. It's it's like they they have an intent, and then they have an execution. And it's the it's the difference, right? Mm -hmm. It's like minding the gap between intention and execution. And even my patients who are vaccine hesitant, or a couple of mine are vaccine refusers, you know, they are they are not bad people. Um, and moreover, if I suggested they, that they were bad people in my attempts to convince them to get vaccinated, it would really not go well. Yeah, they're not dumb people either. But the public health, no. as you pointed out. You're 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 using. Uh, I, I you must keep an eye on Monica Gandhi also, who has been champion. I mean, Monica is a dear uh, friend of mine. Production. I love Monica. Yeah, uh, yeah, and she's great, and I retweet her stuff all day long. Uh, and and she, but but I, I would go one step further than the harm avoidance sort of strategy, which we not only learn that you can't, you can't stand on high and mandate don't have sex. You can't do that. We tried to do that during the HIV epidemic. It did not work. What we found is a whole discipline developed on how to shape health behaviors from a public health standpoint. An actual discipline developed, and to my amazement they abandoned that discipline during this pandemic and that is you you what you do is you show narratives you have relatable sources like the characters are relatable to you in the narrative you show consequences of people's health choices you use humor and music and that's it that's how you, that's how you shape behavior you don't you or i in a box does not change behavior it just doesn't but if it somebody really doesn't. i mean you know a, yeah it really doesn't. I mean, the way I'm able to help someone, for example, like quit smoking or cut back on alcohol or whatever it is they need to do to change their behaviors, to change their health and improve their health is by relating to them, by offering empathy, offering compassion, and then offering them tools and and meeting them where they are. And so, you know, it, it, the same applies to public health. The problem is, and this is why I, I, I feel I, I have empathy, believe it or not, for Rochelle Walensky and Dr. Fauci, um, is sure. that, you know, they're trying to message, I'm trying to message to an individual patient, which is, is hard. They're trying to message to people who on the one hand don't believe COVID exists. And on the other hand are triple vaxxed N95 masking, you know, outside. I mean, yeah. that's a tall order, right? So the problem is yeah. we are, now that we have vaccines that are extraordinarily effective, we need to you know, not cater and organize our behaviors and our entire lives around a virus that for most people, once they've been fully vaccinated, is a mild illness. Right. But same thing is true, though, of people under the age of 25. And so, which is another mm -hmm. really interesting piece of this, that we've sacrificed youth for the elderly, which is, I've never seen happen before, but I, I, that I, that's not a, that's not a, 
that's not a diathesis. That's not a construct that I would sign off on if I could. I would prefer to support the youth and sacrifice myself. Ask any parent. That's that's essentially what we do. Uh, but okay. Uh, in any event, uh, so so the, the the there's another sort of astonishing. As we're talking about astonishing moments, uh, I I had peers say to me the following words that I found. Well, I. I'm going to call it what it was. I, I thought they were stupid because it didn't make sense. It was literally nonsense. What they would say to me, uh, in the middle of a pandemic, and pandemics are defined by excess death. So if, if you are in a pandemic, there are more people dying in that year than is ordinary. That's Excess death defines pandemic. And what I heard from peers was, one death is too many. And I thought, mm -hmm. oh, my God. What, what do you what does that even mean what, what do you mean by that we're in a pandemic we are going to have excess death that's the pandemic that's what that means now we could minimize that and keep it to an absolute that we're going to fight like hell to, to be, develop responses to it and keep it down and figure out how to treat people to keep them from dying but but safety uber alice became this weird construct that i've never really seen before so living living was a sort of um almost like a, some sort of incidental concern. But safety, uber Alice, was what what was prevailing. That was weird to me. That was another astonishing moment. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I no, my thoughts on that are, are very parallel to what you're saying. I mean, if you think about it this way, I mean, we somehow have tolerated every year 20 to 40,000 American lives lost due to influenza. Um, yep. I'm not saying that we should. In fact, I think we've learned so many lessons from the pandemic that, that, that and people maybe didn't have their eyes open to the fact that, that we lost that many people every year. Um, and maybe people will get their flu shots. I hope they do. I got mine. I hope you got yours. Everyone should get a flu shot in addition to their COVID shots. Um, but, but, you know, we cannot, we cannot scrub and sanitize the world from endemic viruses. Um, we, right. yes, in a pandemic, right. we are doing everything we can to limit excess death and destruction and, and basically to, to, to not overwhelm our hospital systems, but to expect no death, to expect zero COVID is really, um, I mean, it's just not scientifically possible because A, we have animal vectors, B, people spread this virus without even having symptoms, and C, the vaccines aren't perfect. So it's not possible. So what we can do is as Monica says, take the fangs away from the virus by getting vaccinated and then protect ourselves from despair by living our lives um, in tandem with being cautious against about COVID, protecting ourselves, our families, and our communities. We can do both. Um, but to say that we should, you know, have no, you know, zero deaths from COVID heretofore would mean that we'd have to lock ourselves in little, in saran wrap and never leave our houses. And that's not a life worth living for most people. I I don't mean to be uh, glib about this, but but we've sort of forgotten how lucky we are. I I, I um I was struck. The I don't know if you used to watch the TV show The Nick. I was I really liked that show, and it's about a, a New York hospital at the turn of the 20th century and a group of surgeons just trying to do things. To, you know, everybody died no matter what they did, and so they were just trying stuff because if they could get somebody not to die, it would be it was an extraordinary success. And the there was a eulogy one of these surgeons was presenting in the first episode, and he goes. He goes, medicine is making great strides as we enter the 20th century. A child born today can expect to live to the age of 42. And I thought, wow, he's that's, that was only 100 or so years ago. And you, we really forget oh about how lucky we are and how, how extraordinary that this is in, in, the, in the history of humanity that I, at the age of 63, can feel as good as I do and have my prostate cancer treated and take my flu shot and you know do all these things and, and get through COVID you know, without... Take a monoclonal antibody that got me through COVID. I mean, that's amazing. It's just, we should be grateful. For yeah, that. I mean, absolutely. In this country, we are living in an embarrassment of riches with the amount of vaccines um, that are so incredibly effective with access um, 
if if people are lucky enough to have it to monoclonal antibodies with two incredible oral antivirals on the pipeline, molnupiravir and Paxlovid, which I do think will be game changers when we pair them with rapid tests that hopefully are coming um, to be more accessible and affordable to people and hopefully free. Um, we yeah we 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 are in a a very very luxurious privileged position in this in this country, um, yet the divide between the haves and the have nots is getting worse um, in -hmm. large part because of these restrictions and lockdowns. And um, Mm -hmm. it's, Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's tragedy. I mean, yeah. And, and we have put into place explicitly racist policies explicitly that segregate people who are trying to make choices but don't know who to trust to get the right information. So rather than an outreach to those people to try to help build that trust, we're segregating. And these are racist policies. Let's make no mistake about it. When you, when you see a, a – if they're systemically racist, let's put it at least that way. It's a, a policy that looks at how the percentage of vaccine acceptance is breaking down and says, we're going to exclude these people, and it has a specific racial breakdown – I don't know what else you can call it, as opposed to trying to solve the problem of reaching and building trust and helping people make good choices. I, I, I am to me that's uh, breathtaking, breathtaking. The, I, I totally agree. I think you know structural racism it, it infiltrates every pore of society right now, as as by definition. Um, and I think, I mean, I just come back to the basic fundamental facts of how we relate to each other as human beings, um, and this is certainly true in the doctor's office, is, you know, empathy, listening, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. acceptance, Mm -hmm. and then trust. Compassion. And compassion. And, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, I think we all want the same thing. I mean, we may want different variations of the same thing. We want to, we want to protect our loved ones. We want to have food at our table. We want to have ideally meaningful work, but we want to have work and we want to be connected and feel loved. Play. And no, don't at forget, the risk of sounding but, but cheesy. Work, work, work. I'm going I'm to I'm interrupt you. Work, love, play. We, we play as part of yeah. uh, health. I mean, those are the three. Yeah. Right. So I'm hoping that on Thanksgiving, we can look at each other as not just vectors of disease but as vessels of <laughs> compassion right like i hope you know we will because we are going to be at the thanksgiving table it's my parents who are vaccinated my brothers yeah. my nieces who are partially vaccinated we'll do a little rapid testing mm-hmm. to make sure no one's bringing in infectious levels of virus in that very mm-hmm. moment but you know we're going to kind of like make it normal because we are grateful for science and the, and the wonders of these uh vaccines so let me let me make a um, a couple of specific topics I want to bring up. The, the, I'm, I'm watching a restream chat while we talk here, and uh, people are at, a lot of questions about myocarditis, and I guess we'll get into okay, that. Okay, sure. Let me just ask one. Yeah. Yeah. One of the questions was because I don't know what to make of the stories that I hear. Are are you making anything of the young athletes that seem to be? I don't know if they're having sudden death or syncope or, or what. I, I I can't get the data on that together. Are you are, you, are we to make anything of that? You mean, are you talking about from COVID? No, you, there's, there's, I, the, I, I've been ignoring it because it's been so anecdotal, but, but somebody's asking, so I'm just asking it. Do we make anything so, of the anecdotes that are flying around about athletes? I think they're implying that there's so, sudden death on the soccer fields and there are people having syncope on the sac- soccer fields and being found to have myocarditis related to their vaccines. That's sort of the implication. I can't find it collated or, or, or in any way reported in a source that I find reliable. Well, I watched in real time a European soccer player collapse because of a sudden cardiac arrest. Did you see that? It was a couple months ago. My kids are soccer players. Yes, my I husband's did. a. But I did. but as far as I know, that wasn't vaccine related or COVID related. But but here here are the facts because we of course anecdotes are interesting and and make headlines. But we we want to look at you know data. Um, you know, myocarditis is a is a real but very rare potential complication of the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, more commonly for, for uh, Moderna, in teenage boys and young men. It is very, very rare, but it's also 
it's also a thing. Um, usually it's treatable, usually it's mild, and moreover, COVID itself can cause myocarditis. Myocarditis is inflammation of the muscle of the heart. So I have a 17-year-old son. Um, I, have a, I have two sons. I have one who's 19. Um, my uh, boys, I'm going to not rush out to get them a third dose because A, they're at low risk right. for poor outcomes from COVID to begin with. And B, because they're in the right. age category, that it puts them at a little bit higher risk. And it's just there's no – I'm not seeing the benefit of, them, of vaccinating them three times uh, when they're young boys. Right. Exactly. I, I completely agree. Now, so the, the incidence of uh, myocarditis, pericarditis also is somewhere around 1 to 5, 1 to 6,000 per, you know, per uh, injection. And, you know, we, and it's all so far been mild and self-limited and no big deal. But when we start vaccinating millions of people – there may be some big deal. Um, and the question becomes, how do you help? I, I don't know how to do this because I'm not a pediatrician. I, I, how do you help parents make the choice whether the risk reward is worth it? Uh, the probability of getting serious myocarditis or serious COVID for a nine-year-old is zero. And for the vaccine, it's one in 5,000, which is nearly zero. <laughs> so I, I, it's a confusing territory for me. It is. And this is where we really need, you know, to risk stratify a kid. So a kid who is obese, a kid who has type one diabetes, a kid who's immune suppressed, absolutely. Sure. Um, I'd get them one for and two sure. shots. Um, but for healthy kids, you know, I still, I still, you know, look, I'm not a pediatrician either, but I, you know, I have lots of pediatrician friends. I am a mother um, and I do follow the data um, yeah. pretty darn closely. So the, the, I, I'm recommending the vaccine to, to kids because number one, so look at it this way, we are all gonna be exposed to coronavirus at some point. It's not a question of if, it's when. And I'd rather my five-year-old have vaccine-induced immunity than coronavirus-induced immunity from getting the infection itself. Um, because the safety well, data is there, and because we've already vaccinated so many kids, I, I can't remember the number at this point, it's three million kids, I think, one dose. Um, like and yeah. we haven't seen any. So, we haven't seen any safety signals so far on the real state, the world stage. So, so you're bringing up another topic, which is uh, people are starting to say finally under their breath that we are probably all going to have hybrid immunity one day. Uh, that endemic is yeah. code for the virus constantly circulates, and we all get it, and it comes, you know, waves and up and down in terms of its uh, its um, incidence. But ultimately, we're all going to have something called hybrid immunity, which is the vaccine and then the then the illness itself, which will give us a very broad immunity that will probably dampen this thing out over time quite quite nicely. And now that we have the antiviral therapies, so we have three we have we have sort of two ways to make the the illness itself incidental: a the vaccine, so you're pretty much guaranteed to have mild illness, and two you take the antivirals when you test positive. The interesting thing to me is, do you think we'll hit a time when we will start advocating to get exposed in the six months after your second vaccine when you're optimally vaccinated rather than waiting till your immunity wanes and risking more severe illness down the road when you eventually get exposed to COVID? Isn't that kind of interesting? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So you're not going to hear me recommend... <laughs> Like going out and just it's hard, getting yeah. COVID to like let it rip. But, I'm but you, but, in but, but you might say, but you might say, take a mask off, and if you get it, well, oh, sure. you're at least optimally vaccinated now. So, so there's a difference between recognizing reality, which is that we will be exposed, and recommending mm -hmm. putting yourself out there intentionally or unintentionally, right? right? So, so right. it's a it's a little bit of a yeah. different posture, although you you know there's some a little bit of semantics, but. The the point is that yeah. once you've been vaccinated, you're not you're not bulletproof, um, and and certainly sir, there are some people who are at higher risk for poor outcomes, even though they've you know had the the vaccine. If they're elderly or infirm, right. um, organ transplant patients. Um, but the truth is, yes, once you know we have lifted restrictions, we will all and and even now we're all going to be exposed to coronavirus at some point, and and getting a little like microdose of a virus is certainly going to top off our immunity. Um, and some of us won't even have symptoms. Some of us will have mild symptoms. Um, I'll be interested in hearing you and Jay Bhattacharya's conversation and what he says about, um, 
you know, encouraging people to get yes. COVID. To, yeah. to, to well, I don't, I don't think you could, I don't think, I, yeah, I don't think ethically you can encourage somebody because you're putting people at risk of, of attention, an unforeseen bad outcome. But, but I think to say, hey, look, wearing your mask in the six months after you're vaccinated may not be the smartest thing because well, yeah right. you're you sure you don't yeah you don't want covid but should you get it the time to get it is the six months after you're vaccinated uh i i don't know i don't know what to do with that it's just it's a thought experiment flying around in my head and well, uh and because people are starting to talk about go ahead well, let's look at what happened this summer with rsv right it, that was largely because of an immunity debt you know because kids weren't you know, doing their mm -hmm. normal kid thing, and they that that all of a sudden RSV surged, and mm -hmm. you know I don't have a perfect explanation of why RSV surged when it did, but certainly part of it is because kids had uh, an immunity debt, and so you know our immune systems need to be worked out, like our our muscles at the gym, right? So um, without mm -hmm. little exposures here and there, um, our immune system doesn't get tested. It's not to say again in all caps, we're not encouraging people going out and getting coronavirus. But the reality right. is that we will be right. exposed right. and we will develop hybrid immunity over time, vaccine induced plus infection induced immunity um, that will get us through to the other side. I, by the way, um, think I have a th suspicion. I have hybrid immunity. I had, I had bad COVID, then I got Johnson & Johnson vaccine. By the way, I, I woke up on day two after my J&J &J vaccine with spontaneous raccoon eyes, which uh, oh. is the presented feature of the uh, presenting feature of the transverse sinus thrombosis, which was a lovely wow. thought as I looked in the mirror. <laughs> yeah, and it all I had no other symptoms and it all went away spontaneously, but I definitely had some sort of platelet consumptive something going on. Uh, just Gosh, fortunately, it didn't completely fill my transverse. Isn't that? Yeah, yeah, it was pretty. I I knew, you know, I felt fine, but looking in the mirror at the at the black eye, I thought, I I know what this mean. I know what this could potentially mean, and it's not a good thing. Uh, but it all passed. Uh, but I don't look forward to taking, uh, uh, you know, a, a second J and J vaccine. Nor do I. Anyway, so I have hybrid immunity. I've, I've been testing broad antibody panels on myself, and my um, my my neutralizing antibodies went up recently. I think I may have been re-exposed and had no clinical symptoms. It's kind of interesting uh, that maybe you know with good hybrid immunity, you can sustain it with you know with community exposure. You know what I mean? That this is sort of another yeah, interesting sort of that, thing no one's and, talking and about. Yeah. Yeah. No, and that is the reality of 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 life with an endemic virus, which ultimately SARS-CoV-2 yeah. will be like the other four coronaviruses, and we will be we'll have little micro exposures. We'll get colds um, from COVID. Yeah. We will get mild flus in some cases, and then we'll get a little top off of our immunity. And you know, who knows if we'll need vaccines for COVID once a year? But you know, to people who say, "Oh yeah. gosh, three shots does this mean every year?" and they're kind of hand wringing about it, I say, look. Worst case scenario, we need a shot once a year. I mean, that's just not a big deal, particularly in this wealthy country we live in where we have so many doses available. Um, I think, you know, yeah, as and, you... And, yeah. My, Go ahead, finish, please. As you, as you, as you, as you might agree, I mean, I think, it, you know, I, I wish we could take the third doses we're giving to healthy people overseas to people who don't mm -hmm. even have access to the first dose, not just because I'm a nice person, I'm a pretty yeah. nice person, but because it's also it's also the way to, to tamp down the virus globally, um, but it's also the right thing to do. Anyway, that's I don't have that yeah. in my powers. Yeah, and, and most of the, the unpleasant vaccine side effects we're seeing are it, it really after that second dose. And, and as as and in Europe, they're stretching it out to 12 weeks with kids, and you're right. seeing less of those unpleasant side effects. And so the booster is less likely to give you trouble. Um, I want to I want to take a little break. Uh, sure. And when we come back, talk about antivirals specifically. I think I'd, I've been left with this weird COVID symptom, which my thinking blocks inevitably in, in if i have a conversation of one hour duration i'll have a something all of a sudden i'll be unable to produce whatever it was i was thinking and that's happening to me right now so i don't know what it was i was going to say about vaccine therapy I'm but sure I, I did did have 
it, it was vitally important, I, I'm sure. Oh, I know what it was. It was that, um, you know what I tell people is that it, it's a three-part series, much like yes. for adults, much like HPV. It's not, it's not a booster. Yep. It's a three-part vaccine series. And, and then we'll see what that, boosting that's is. That's what we're learning. That. Yeah. Okay. I will uh, take a little break. We are here with Dr. Lucy McBride and uh, be right back, talk about what we're going to do therapeutically to really make this thing be much less of an issue than it has been. I want to give a shout out to our good friends at Blue Mics. If you've heard my voice on this show anytime over the past year, including right now, you've been listening to Blue Microphones. And let me tell you, after more than 30 years in broadcasting, I don't think I've ever sounded better. But you don't need to be a pro or have a fancy studio to benefit from a quality mic. You may not realize it, but if you've been working from home or using Zoom to chat with friends, you probably spend a lot of time in front of a microphone. So why not sound your best? Whether you're doing video conferencing, podcasting, recording music, or hosting a talk show, Blue has you covered. From the USB series that plugs right into your computer to XLR professional mics like the mouse or the Blueberry we use in the studio right now. Bottom line, there's a Blue microphone to fit your budget and need. I can't say enough about Blue mics. And once you try one, you will never go back. Trust me. To take your audio to the next level, go to drdrew.com slash blue. That is drdrew.com slash B-L-U-E. Anyone who's watched me over the years knows that I'm obsessed with Hydrolyte. In my opinion, the best oral rehydration product on the market. I literally use it every day. My family uses it. When I had COVID, I'm telling you, Hydrolyte contributed to my recovery, kept me hydrated. Now, with things finally reopening back around the country, the potential exposure to the common cold is always around. And like always, Hydrolyte has got your back. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity, my new favorite, starts with their fast-absorbing electrolytes and adds a host of great ingredients Plus, each single-serving easy-pour drink mix contains 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C, 300 milligrams of elderberry extract. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity comes in convenient, easy-to-pour sticks that rapidly dissolve in water, make a great-tasting drink, has 75% less sugar than your typical sports drink, uses all natural flavors, gluten-free, dairy-free, caffeine-free, non-GMO, and even vegan. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity is also now available in ready-to-drink bottles at the Walmart next to the pharmacy, or as always, you can find it by visiting hydrolyte.com slash Dr. Drew. Again, that is H-Y-D-R-A-L-Y-T-E dot com slash D-R-D-R-E-W. Be sure to use the code Dr. Drew 25 for a special discount. Here with my daughter, Paulina, to share an exciting new project. Over the years, we've talked to a ton of young people about what they really want to know about relationships. It's difficult to know who you are and what you want, especially mm. as a teenager. And not everyone has access to an expert in their house like I did. Of course, it wasn't like I was always that receptive to that advice. Right, no kidding. But now we have written the book on consent. It is called It Doesn't Have to Be Awkward, and it explores relationships, romantic relationships, and sex. It's a great guide for teens, parents, and educators to go beyond the talk and have honest and meaningful conversations. It Doesn't Have to Be Awkward will be on sale September 21st. You can order your book anywhere books are sold. Mm -hmm. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, and of course, your independent local bookstore. Links are available on drdrew.com. So pre-ordering the book will help people, well, raise awareness, obviously, and it'll get that conversation going early so more people can can notice this and spread the word of positivity about healthy relationships. So if you can, we would love your support by pre-ordering now. Totally. And as we said before, this is a book that both teenagers and their parents should read. Read the book, have the conversation. It doesn't have to be awkward. On sale, September 21st. We are back with Dr. Lucy McBride. Go to her website, lucymcbride.com, to get the newsletter where you can get more information like we were describing. Um, Lucy, my uh, producer, has jumped in and asked us to take calls before we go into the uh, right. conversation about the antivirals. So we're uh, on Clubhouse. Those of you on Clubhouse, raise your hand. I'll bring you up to the uh, podium. And again, we'll be streaming out on multiple platforms. You agree to such as when you come up to the platform. Casey, what's going on? Hey, Dr. Drew, Dr. McBride. Got a quick question here. Um, so I had a couple of kids that I work with uh, that uh, stop by and see me every now and then. And uh, they all are, they've gotten their uh, first two uh, shots, uh, vaccinations. And uh, they're hearing about kids getting sick from booster shots and stuff like this. And they don't want to take it, even though uh, their parents and their teachers are saying they have to. So the question I have is, at what point do you allow kids to make this decision on their own what what age group are we talking at about what age what, yeah, what well, age are you 11 talking 12 about? 13 14 
and, and somebody is requiring a booster? That doesn't sound right. Uh, yeah, they were. Well, they just stopped by yesterday, and they were like, "Yeah, they, we have to get our boosters, and we don't want to get them." Hmm. Lucy. Well, boosters are not even recommended right now by the CDC. Yeah. Um, so right. I, I hey. would not boost. Uh, I would not boost an eleven or twelve year old. Um, no. For a number of reasons, one because it's 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 not recommended right now. It's it's still on emergency use authorization, um, and and two because kids are relatively low risk for poor outcomes from COVID, and so I I, I think they don't yeah they don't need boosters. Are you sure that you sure they're not talking about the second vaccine? They 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 all said we've already had two, and now they want us to no, get one more. Don't no, that's that is no. Nope. I, I would argue that is not just unethical, Who are but, they? yeah, but possibly illegal. So, oh, well, uh, you guys actually met one of them. Jorge was one of them. No, no. Who who is requiring them? Oh, they, 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 they. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I'm, just, I'm assuming it's going to be the the school board, the school itself. What what city? Uh, it would be Santa Barbara. Sheesh. I don't know what to make of that's, it, that's but a, uh, I would make some noise. Unusual. S- it sounds so almost sounds like uh, like a, maybe a little bit of overreach or uh, I, I, I don't I, I'd like to know what what should happen is whoever's saying that needs to be counseled by a medical professional. That's right. Well, uh, Santa Barbara. I mean, yeah, yeah. We may Thanks, learn Casey. down the road. We may learn down the road that it's a three shot series for kids, but we do not have data to support that recommendation right now. Exactly. So, so understand for medical professionals to of any stripe to be recommending something there has to be an evidence basis for it or at least the evidence you know the the provisional evidence for evidence <laughs> so, something that leads us uh, some objective data and now no we don't have that that, that that's very bizarre all that right so let's bizarre. go to the antivirals yeah uh so i i i was very interested in the molnupiravir data the the merck product and then I saw the Pfizer data with the um, Paxlovid, and I was blown away by what that looks like. So uh, my, my question really is, how do, you, how do you think we're going to use these? I almost feel like Molnupiravir is, my sort of spidey sense is the Molnupiravir is going to really be the new, um, here's my COVID brain again, um, the the flu the fl- anti-flu anti-influenza like Tamiflu uh, medication it's going to be the new Tamiflu and while Paxlovir Paxlovid rather is going to be really to treat illness it's going to be ciprofloxacin uh, you know what I mean uh, what do you think I think you have a good spidey sense I love that that word um, because we're still watching the data play out and. Uh, what I what I what I do feel pretty strongly about is that we need to get more rapid testing available to people, um, ideally for free, because it's not going to make a difference that we have oodles of antiviral medications that can be taken by mouth if we don't have the tests accessible and affordable for people to. Because remember, you have to take these medicines when you have a new diagnosis of COVID nineteen in the first three to five days after the diagnosis. Um, so we can't have, yeah. you know, testing delays. We need a lot of rapid tests to couple with the prescription. So it's going to be an interesting time. But I do think that these oral medicines combined with ongoing vaccination are going to really t- take us forward and, and, and hasten our, um, you know, basically turn this from a pandemic to an epidemic. Right. Or an endemic. Yeah. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm a little concerned about the, the rigid um, requirement of, of a positive test. I, I would hope that they would also add a high index of suspicion on behalf of the physician. For instance, I don't know if you've seen some of this stuff, but I was a, I, I personally was a case in point. I didn't convert on the rapid antigen until day four, and I was really sick by that point. And the molnupiravir may not have that much effect by the time I got that right. sick. Absolutely. I mean, like everything in medicine, there has to be clinical judgment and pretest probability. So, like, if I have a patient who has a family, a household full of flu members, right? Like let's say her whole family has influenza and she herself has mm-hmm. body aches, fever, and a cough and her flu test is negative. 
I don't really believe that test because my pretest probability is so high. In other words, we have to be able to use clinical right. judgment. I will put that person on Tamiflu and you know get a second test if I can. Um, similarly, we should be able to exercise clinical judgment in these in these in the, with these medications. And I also will be interested to see if we can use them down the road for post exposure prophylaxis. So if you have a you know a household full of COVID family members, or you have a high risk yeah. individual. Um, could you put yep. them on it before before they get sick? That's I'll put. I would. I I put my bet on that's going to be molnupiravir. That's what that's. I think be. so. I, I'm going to guess much too. Like Tamiflu. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the one of the other astonishing things in the pandemic was uh, pharmacists refusing physician orders. I, I I worry that that's going to get involved here when people start, you know, learning how to use antivirals. I, I'm very concerned about that. I mean, there are so many concerns and so much, so much worry that I have about the state of medicine and medical care in this country. It's like where to even begin. I mean, first of all, as you know, 80 million Americans plus don't have access to a primary care provider, which to me should be the hub for problem solving, the place where you go to get your medical information. Um, you know, we didn't even get vaccine access for our patients, which seems crazy because who who more do you trust than your primary care doctor to, to dispense like fact-based information but yeah the pharmacist mm -hmm. i mean at the same time i love the pharmacists that i work with they're they're wonderful people and they're essential workers um but mm -hmm. we have a lot of work to do in this country on healthcare and the provide the pro providing yeah it. yeah the, the way our peers froze uh, yeah, primary care just was not uh I don't know. I, I don't like the way it went down uh, in the pandemic. It was, it was not what I'm accustomed to, or at least what I'm trained to do, which is to improvise, use what I have on hand, do the best I can for the patient in the moment, not send them home until their oxygen saturation drops below a certain level. That that was another astonishing moment in this thing. Yeah, I mean, like we can't I, treat I, you, I, just go home. What? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, I, I wrote an article for MedPage about. Um, about primary care and how, you know, of course I'm biased because I'm a primary care doctor, but, you know, particularly as we start to recover from what I'm calling a collective trauma of the pandemic, mm -hmm. you know, people are going to need so much more care than they did before. I mean, people have left their underlying conditions undealt with, people have gained weight, people have mm -hmm. been drinking mm -hmm. more, you know, substance use disorder is raging, people are depressed and anxious, and people aren't well. Um, and where better to put all of those issues in a primary care doctor's office if that person has access to a primary care doctor and the doctor has time and, and, and doctors in primary care are incentivized to talk to patients about their everyday lived experiences and not just check the boxes and say, oh, wait, you, get, you gained weight over the pandemic, your cholesterol is high, here's more Lipitor, exercise more, see you next year. We need, we need really to invest in primary care as the... Um, mm -hmm you know, the hub for problem solving. Well, and it, 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 yeah. It seems like the, the collective uh, sort of response is that, oh, we'll give you more physician extenders. That's how we're going to deal with this. And that's great. And they're well-trained physician extenders out there. And I, I value them, but I'm not sure that's what we're really, I don't know. It misses the point a little bit, doesn't it? Well, you know, I, I think we need more, I, need, I think we need to incentivize medical students to go into primary care as a field, but why would you want to go into mm -hmm. primary care right now if, if primary care is being treated as sort of the stepchild of medicine, right? If you have five minutes to see a patient who's on 15 medications and you can't connect with them and learn about their relationship to yeah. stress and yeah. all the things that matter when you're caring for human beings. So, you know, again, we have our work cut out for us. The pandemic has really laid bare our vulnerabilities as human beings, but also in our healthcare system. Yeah, uh, b back to the uh, physician extenders. So their response. So I keep hearing is, well, we'll you'll just you'll just you know supervise physician extenders, and they'll spend the time with the patient, and uh, you will supervise twenty of them and accept all the liability for everything, every decision made. It's like I, you can't. It's impossible. It just doesn't work like that. It's like all right. Let's take another call here. Uh, hold on a second here. Uh, Josh, get you up to the podium. Go ahead, Josh. Uh, hey, thanks for taking my call. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to talk about the other countries, um, most notably France. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to talk about 
the riots that are going on there. Mm -hmm. And what are we, what am I missing? Because we're not rioting here. I don't feel any real need to riot. (laughs) Uh, I I might be a little upset, but I want to know what's going on in the other countries that we're not seeing because I believe the young people. Well, I'm one of the people that yeah. does. Well, the young people are the ones rioting in France, not so much in Germany and Austria. It's, it's a different thing in Germany. It's, it's funny, each country has their own sort of version of this. And uh, I, I'll before I adulterate things, thanks for the question, Josh. Lucy, what do you say to that? I mean, I think people are upset with the expectations that they can go on in sort of a state of suspended animation for, for much longer. Um, and people want to be heard by their government. Um, you know, the United States of America is a very heterogeneous place, right? I mean, and, and, and you know, how can I say, like, we, we, we have a lot more liberty, um, in, in a sense, but, of course, that comes with a cost. Um, and so, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think, I think that people are fed up. I mean, we saw the, I saw those images in Rome of people, you know, protesting against the government. People are fed up. They need to be handed, they need to feel heard. They want to have tools to, 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 to manage the enormous stress of the pandemic. They need jobs. Um, they need to feed their families and they don't want to be talked down to and they don't want to have draconian restrictions imposed upon them when right. you know, they're doing the best they can to get through the day. I, I can only speak to what was happening in France because we were there about six weeks ago. And what is happening there is the uh, the converse of here, the opposite of here. The young people, meaning really 25 and under, maybe under 30, but particularly 25 and under, uh, were, were, are saying explicitly, now hold on a second. You told us we were at low risk of complication from this illness. And now you are mandating a, a, to, that I put something in my body. You're mandating that. You're not recommending it. You're not offering it. You're mandating it. Th- a government shouldn't be doing that. And th- in their mind, it's actual echoes of 1790. They will say it explicitly. My, my French is pretty good. And I, I talked to a lot of young people there. And they would say, they would say, this the, liberté, fraternité, that's it. Egalité. That's it. Liberté. They would stand up and show me their fist. They go, liberté. It's important. This is this is challenging the basic principles of the revolution of 1790 upon which this government is founded. And they they are really energized by it. They are completely mobilized. It's not a medical question to them. It's a question of the legitimacy and the and the the principles upon which that government was founded. It's kind of interesting. It's very interesting, isn't it? I think it's fascinating, and I think I don't know. I just worry about how we're going to recover from the politicization of this pandemic. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's so many things to worry about and and to lose sleep over. But yeah. Yeah, that that that's we oh the politicization here is a totally different thing, completely different thing, yeah. right? I mean, this was this weird. I, I don't want to get into that because it, I, somebody's got. To, do you believe they will write a post mortem on this thing? Don't you think somebody's got to do a dispassionate, oh, yeah. careful analysis? I, oh, yeah. I, but I'm fearful that's going to be politicized. I, I'm fearful there they won't do many. it I mean, dispassionately. Pro- or, there, uh, uh, there'll be many. I mean, they're being written right now. I mean, there there's so much analysis um, that needs to be done. I mean like you i'm 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 interested in how you know the thing that i'm most interested in right now is how we think about health and how we define health in this country mm-hmm. um because right now mm-hmm. it feels like we're defining health is as, as a negative pcr test or not having covid-19 when mm-hmm. i think you agree health is health is more than the absence of disease um it's about having yep. access to medical care is about being heard being seen um it's about not being lectured to it's about having open communication with a with a trusted guide yep and and health should be part of a a good life and we don't have conversations about what does it mean to live a good life and you sort of you tilted at it earlier work love play meaningful work good relationships all these things this is this is what, and then making a difference for other people, which is part of meaningful right. work, right? And addressing uh, our mental health. I yeah. mean, mental health 
mental health is ground zero for our whole health, right? I mean, we all have anxieties, we all have worries, yeah. we all have moods, we all have relationships, we all experience grief and loss. Those feelings and thoughts drive our behaviors and our behaviors drive our health outcomes. So it's, it's only appropriate to address mental health in the doctor's office and the primary care doctor's office. And what is suffering right now for so many people is mental health, which is you know, at the core of how we feel every day and the core of how we live every day. And so, you know, finally, mental health is having this moment. You know, it's not just a hashtag anymore, although maybe it is for some people. And people are finally yeah. realizing mental health matters. So that's what I'm most interested in. Yeah. And how do we how do we capitalize on this moment to help people realize that health is about mental and physical health in tandem? It's about these parallel train tracks. And that and there's a corollary there, which is, yes, childhood developmental experiences affect our health behaviors later, but that we shouldn't be treating the brain differently than any other organ from the standpoint of its medical management. It's another organ. It has a very spe set of specialized functions and it gets sick and there are treatments it for it. And that's that. That's right. Yeah. Russ, Russ, uh, you want to make a comment or question? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just had a quick question about the VAERS database, uh, V-A-E-R-S. You had a guest, I believe it was last week, who was mm -hmm. adamant about mm -hmm. uh, querying VAERS and, and getting information on the adverse effects. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that lots of doctors are using? Is that something, Dr. McBride, that you uh, reference regularly, or is it such a small percentage overall that it's, it's something you just sort of spot check? You know, it is a it's a it's a good database, but it's also not it, it, anybody can report into VAERS. You know, it's not it's it, it, it was so never it. ever. I'm, I'm a little irritated because you're not the first person to ask me this, Russ. I'm not irritated at you. Oh, okay. I, I, it's never designed for something for physicians to look at on a right. regular basis to help them make decisions. It was never designed that way, ever, ever, ever. It was designed oh, okay. for the government and for the manufacturers. I, I dare say in, uh, in my 40 years of practicing medicine, uh, I've looked at the VAERS data once, and it, and it helped not at all. Uh, and so, yeah. uh, I, Lucy, maybe you feel differently than me. No, I love your clear and passionate description of, of it. I think I think it exists for a reason, but I, I've never used it, and it's never changed clinical management. What, for example, right now, when you think about the vaccine safety, I mean, all we need is the world stage and real world data to see how very effective and safe these vaccines are. VAERS is is not something I I turn towards. Um, and it's not it's, it was never for meant for practice. Pra yeah, right. not meant not. It's not what if 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 somebody used the data and published a peer reviewed article in the journal where they were drawing conclusions from the data, we would be exposed to that. But th this is not does that line to look under the hood and go, oh, this is what's it's not. A, it's not a thermometer for us. You know, it doesn't tell us anything. It, it's it's a very mishmashy collection of data, again, designed for the government and designed for the manufacturers. So they're the ones that primarily use it. So, yeah, it's weird to me that people think we're somehow involved with that. There's many other systems like that out there that doctors don't check. They're, we're not, they're not a part of it. We, it's not how we d develop our judgment. It, it just has nothing to do with it, which is, I guess, surprising to people. Well, right. I mean, even, even you know, peer reviewed studies, I mean, which is what you and I is sort of the, the gospel. Like there's there's you still have to use layer clinical judgment, uh, you know, when you're looking at studies and, and, right. and address the patient That's in front right. of you using the data. The that's right. Not, not only I, I, I get very frustrated with this too, Lucy, which is uh, I, I was sometimes deal with medical students and residents who will come up with these studies and go, look, you see this, this medicine is destroying somebody. I'm like, that study suggests that read the entire landscape of the other peer reviewed journals that are out there, read it in the context of all the other literature that's out there. Then we can have this conversation. It's just a data point at this point. It's not, it, it right. may it, be, it, it may be, a, a, you know, maybe a turn. That's right. It's context. It's, it's absolutely. And that's what medicine and public health is about, right? It's about using evidence and science, you know, layered, on top of the situation, or in the case of a patient, the patient at hand, and then making a shared decision based on science and the person you're dealing with. 
Yeah, that, that's right. So, so, so you go to physicians for their judgment, not their knowledge yes. base. The knowledge goes without the knowledge goes without saying. Most of the things that you th that you're getting exposed to around this pandemic are things we've known since second year of medical school. We then took that and applied it in clinical settings and then expanded our understanding through keeping an eye on the medical literature, which was constantly expanding and exploring and developing our understanding of these, of these issues. It gets very, very complicated. So when you see something hundreds of times, and you know the basic physiology, and you've kept your eye on the on the peer-reviewed literature, it gives you the capacity to make a judgment and to improvise a little bit too, and, but to make the right call for that human being in that particular clinical presentation, which is unlike any, is, it's like other ones, but it's unique. Absolutely, it's about nuance, it's about context, it's about listening to the patient, which is what you and I started out talking about in the beginning, Listening is arguably the best tool in our armamentarium as, as physicians, listening to our patients, understanding what their goals are, their needs, their everyday lived experiences and how those affect you know, their health. And, and, and so the data is, is crucial, but it, as you said, it's judgment as well. Yep, that, that's why you go. You go for the, to make the right call. And that's why there's different opinions on what the right uh, treatment is for a given situation. That, and that's why we scream at each other and share our ideas. And we stopped doing that during the pandemic. We started calling somebody bad person if they had a difference of opinion, which is- oh, Isn't that amazing? Again, it's so, it's weird. amazing. Yeah. I don't think people would say half the things they say on Twitter in person, um, but mm -hmm. still it's, it's, it's horrifying. What kind of stuff do you get out there in social media? Oh, because I'm talking about thinking about off ramps for kids in schools vis-a-vis -vis masking. Mm -hmm. You know, once so my argument is, is is nuanced, but it's it's that once kids have been ensured access to the vaccine, that we need to start thinking about unmasking children because of the harms of masks and the diminishing returns on, 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 on masking, the benefit, the diminishing returns on the benefits once they've been vaccinated. And so, you know, I get accused of being a child killer and proponent of child genocide or blase or flip or privileged, which the privilege thing, look, I'm a privileged person, acknowledge fully that, but that's not a good argument when you're talking about allowing children to be children. The kids who are disproportionately affected by school closures and the restrictions on them are kids um, who are at highest risk because of learning disabilities, language and speech delays, autism, uh, black and brown children who, if they're, who are not, who are, who are suffering disproportionately during the pandemic. So, um, the, 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 anyway, so the, 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 I take getting blowback as a as a compliment in a way because it means I'm the message is resonating, but I also, you know, am trying to convey nuance and context and and not. And, it's hard for people. Yeah, it's hard it's for hard. people to understand. Do a, do a masking do do a mask review generally. People are shocked to hear uh, how how slim the data is on masks when you really evaluate it. Um, the, yeah. the other thing, in terms of you being a, a child killer, let's remember that there are, in the United States so far, 700 pediatric deaths from COVID and 20 of those in otherwise healthy children. So there have been 680 in children with severe illnesses and 20 cases of pediatric deaths in a healthy child. 20. So right. I, I don't know that... And then nominal effect of mask in the face of vaccine. Which is, of course, as you know, and I will say this out loud, is not, it's not to dismiss the lives of those children, not to dismiss children with comorbidities. No. That's just a fact. It's a fact that, that kids who have certain comorbidities are at higher risk, which is distinct from saying we don't care about those children. In fact, we do. And arguably, that's why you vaccinate the teachers, is to protect the vulnerable children. Uh, because they are, yep. they're at and higher maybe, risk. And maybe you do mask those kids. Maybe maybe we do mask and do everything possible to protect those kids, which maybe includes masking I mean, or masking around those kids. Yeah, good. I have no problem with that. But pushing kids into oppositional defiance disorder, other emotional difficulties, poverty, that is f by the by the millions, 
that's a much greater impact on children than COVID itself by much The other greater. thing that's and important that's to get rid to of, awareness about. the other thing we've got to get rid of ultimately, and I think you could argue to do it right now, is, is quarantines. Because, you know, I think a lot of parents aren't necessarily anxious about their kid getting COVID as much as they are anxious about their kid having to be out for 10 days or 14 days. I mean, mm-hmm. parents need to work. Mm-hmm. Kids can't always do virtual school. I mean, the amount of you know, suffering that kids are doing when they're in at home away from their peers and doing virtual school, if it's even offered is crazy. So we need to get these test to stay programs in place. So, you know, we aren't quarantining healthy children. There's, there's really no reason when we have tests to stay, these rapid tests, you know, that in existence to send a, ch- a healthy child home from school because of an exposure when we, when we're, when it, for a knowledge deficit and the knowledge deficit can be completely solved by a rapid test every day after their exposure. Yes. Uh, and uh, again, I, I have to shake my head when we have these conversations about rational approaches to to saving people from the consequences of some of these uh, draconian actions or really the panic that that has caused some of these choices. I just shake my head. I just I don't know what the the public health uh, policy professionals are are, are thinking. I, I don't I don't. It's so confusing to me. I just don't I, get it. I don't really know. I mean, I think I think that it's I think that it's hard for people to admit they're wrong. Look, I don't like admitting I'm wrong. Um, ask my husband. <laughs> I don't like <laughs> acknowledging that that a. Uh, that I have to shift my position on things, but I do, and I have to in my professional life and my personal life, otherwise I wouldn't have any friends or patients. Um, <laughs> the point is that I think it's hard to shift the mindset from you know protect against COVID at all costs to a more nuanced one, but we have to. Um, yeah, we have to. I agree. Let's kind of leave it at that. Susan, do you have any questions for Dr. McBride? Yeah. Nope. Okay. We kind of, we said it all as Howard Stern would say, uh, I'm looking at those of you on the restream to see if there's anything more that you guys, there, there's a lot of, uh, buzz talk on the stream here about Sweden. I don't know quite what they want to ask about Sweden P- comparing com- countries. Oh, Sweden, I'm not sure is a super go ahead. Sweden. Uh, you know, I wish I knew, I, I'm sure the people who are listening know, but the, the Sweden didn't mask kids in schools. They kind of just had normal school. Mm-hmm. And I, I, and they, they, it, it turned out that Sweden, I, okay, I don't want to, I'm not a hundred percent sure about that, but, but Sweden, you know, the schools weren't like on fire with COVID despite not masking children. Yeah. That's what I think they're asking about. Right. But again, I, I don't know. I mean, we do have data yeah, and- that, that in the U S when you control for vaccination rates in the community and you control for teacher vaccination rates that lifting masks don't make that big of a difference in schools for school transmission but again i will be accused of being blase flip about children's health or teacher health um in some capacity by just saying that but um the data is there the data is the data as we say then that's that's that and i why they're yeah, not in god, uh, in god we trust everyone else data. From data. yeah yeah exactly that's it uh, all right. Well, it's been a pleasure to spend a little time with you and chat with you. Uh, we'll get the we'll get the newsletter at uh, lucymcbride.com, right? Is that where I get it? That's exactly right, Drew. Thanks for having me. It's it's a pleasure to talk to you, and I I hope we can talk well, again. Thank you, th- thank you for sharing your training and your wisdom and your judgment and uh, turning it into a source of information that I hope people can trust again that's that's to me is the biggest problem right now they don't know where to turn to get solid information and i think you're you're one of those folks and so there's I think the news I'm trustworthy. I, just I, mean, I, I have no agenda i have no agenda other than to help people and if people don't want to subscribe they can unsubscribe and you just you there's an archive and you just what do you get the updates you click on get my updates and they just put your email we'll in and that's it yeah there it is that's it that's it that's it and then every Monday you'll get a little missive kind of, uh, I usually write these over the weekend or on Sunday, kind of t- this week was about preparing for Thanksgiving. Um, sometimes I'll write about managing, you know, anxiety. Sometimes I'll write about depression. Sometimes I'll write about 
relationships and how we talk to our family about controversial subjects like the vaccine in mixed company. Um, mm-hmm. Because again, health to me is about more than just this single virus. It's about our, it's about, it's about all of it. A good life. Uh, and I'm all signed up. So I'll be reading your newsletter on Monday oh, and uh, hopefully we, and hopefully you won't be a stranger and we'll get a chance to meet in person sometime. That'd be fun. I'd love it. All right. Thanks, Drew. Thank you so much, everybody. Keep doing the hard work. Yeah, Dr. Lucy McBride with us Thank today. Thank you so much. And tomorrow, Dr. Our, my pleasure. And tomorrow, Dr. Bhattacharya. That's right. And then on Monday, Alex Berenson. On Tuesday, Dr. Vinay Prasad, who I've been trying to get here for quite some time. I, I used to have a nervous breakdown every December 2nd. Mm-hmm. Remember? I don't remember it being December 2nd. I remember it being it towards, around December towards 2nd, the holidays. The first week of December. Because? I don't know. I had all these kids and then I was always like preparing for Thanksgiving. And then I had to like have Christmas cards in the Mm -hmm. mail by December 1st or whatever. And we'd have to have the pictures and then we'd have to, I'd have to address them all. And then, you know, we had to decorate for, we just got off of decorating for Halloween and then we have to decorate for Thanksgiving. And then after that, you have to decorate for Christmas Mm -hmm. And take care of kids, and then they're all in the skew, the musicals at school, <laughs> and you have to do <laughs> exams. Right. And right, you're right. I mean, it used to, you know. And then, and then, and I, was, and then I would always have a, a a rush of patients around the. Uh, oh Christmas. yeah, and all, all your old people would, would get sick at the yeah. same time, and then I would have an anxiety attack, and want to check into Los Encinas. <laughs> Or maybe I just drive you over there. I really, really wanted to. <laughs> One time he said, I'm going to check you in because I wanted to jump out of the car. And you go, I'm going to check you in Las Encinas. And I said, please do. Yeah, please take please. It. I need it. Please give me seven days off. But you know what I did? Mm. I quit doing Christmas cards before everybody else. You know, Then you pe- stopped wanting to jump out of moving vehicles on the freeway. Like, I got a Christmas card from Caleb today. Mm-hmm. And it's beautiful. It's his baby. And it's the only one I'll probably put on display. Maybe Pee Wee Herman. I like his. Pee Wee sends one every year. But I don't know why people really do that unless they have little babies or the, you know, it's kind of like a baby announcement. Yeah. Yeah. I think I have. You know, when I get a picture of a couple and there it is. uh, There it is. Oh, look at that. Look at him. Look at that. He's doing so good. (laughs) Happiest baby (laughs) ever. Look at that. Oh, oh, it's a white Santa, though. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) <laughs> you're, you're, you're not allowed to do that according to oh, the no. yeah, yeah you gotta, did you yeah. know they're gonna have uh they have black santas at, at disneyland now which is good that's yeah good. it's got, everything's <laughs> that's okay it's okay and so he's too cute don't worry about he that he is stuff. cute and, and so thank you uh, caleb for today's show appreciate it and uh we've got again some really interesting stuff coming down down the line here people i wanted to talk to for a while dr mcbride is one of those people dr Bhattacharya, we want to check back yeah in we we kind of did a a regroup doctor style. Yeah, Dr. Barron. It's always the same Barrett's stuff. Today. We know it. But well, so yeah, Susan's being critical of me because we review the same stuff, but what that's what doctors that's okay. do. Like, that's okay. To I mean, see where I'm testing to see if there's differences of opinion amongst different Not peers. really. There isn't. I know. Well, we, you can get um, Dr. Victory in I here. I like she'll the have, question that Casey ideas. had, though. I, if I had an 11 to 13-year-old, I would not be getting him a booster. It's not recommended. But but if we want to get Dr. Victory in here, she'll have different ideas than But me, the one so. kid has um, MS, right? Was mm-hmm. it a, didn't he have MS or something? And that's like a really well, tough situation. Well, certainly want to get fully vaccinated. I don't know about, about booster, but... They don't want to get vaccinated. the infection, for sure. Uh, thank you over on Clubhouse. Uh, I'm going to uh, end the room on Clubhouse. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate you joining us. We'll be back in tomorrow with Dr. Bhattacharya. And, What's uh, Dr. Bhattacharya going to talk about? I, I don't know. I just want an update from him. I, I may not talk that long, actually, because he, he's just a really smart guy who keeps his eye on the data and uh, just see what the trends are, what's bothering him. Maybe he can do a little... He, he, Let's if anybody talk can about predict, how to handle this in, during the holidays. He, he, he's, remember, he didn't, go to, he didn't do a residency, so he's not a clinical person. He's a numbers person. And uh, he he could really kind of help us predict the future. That that's what I'm interested in with Dr. Patricia. You know, what's what? So he's a next? psychic? <laughs> no, no, he's a he, he's a he's a scientist. <laughs> okay, no, that's good. No, I'm I'm just joking around. I know he's All right. not a psychic. Thank you guys for stopping by. We'll be here tomorrow at three o'clock. We'll see you then. Poor Caleb. Mm-hmm. <laughs>
You know it is when I rush for the door. I know. So. You got to give him a little warning. Yeah, he's still, he's... <laughs> Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful